All right, this is the second class in the series of our conversion program titled, officially titled, <coughs> pardon me, The History and Effects of Anti-Semitism, <coughs> commonly called the anti-Semitism class. So we say tongue-in-cheek, I'm not going to teach you how to be an anti-Semite. I'm going, I know, I know, y'all are all disappointed because it was, it was announced today that Rabbi is teaching the anti-Semitism class. That's not what this means. The book that we use for this class, that we reference anyway, is a book called A Convenient Hatred, The History of Anti-Semitism by Phyllis Goldstein. It's a really good book. There's lots of good books on the topic. This one just seemed to be one of the books that's most concise when dealing with various periods of history. There is another book that is very interesting to read and informative written by a former Catholic priest called Constantine Sword. It's a bit more in-depth. It, it, it reads like his, his life's journey. So, again, it's not as concise as a convenient hatred, but it is an interesting book to read to watch someone who is a Catholic priest coming to the realization of uh, the realities of anti-Semitism. So, <clears throat> the purpose of this class is... is uh, largely historical, and we're going to be covering anti-Semitism as it has seemingly developed from antiquity to today and how it exists today. But really, the, the ultimate purpose of this class is to deal with anti-Semitism that may and most likely does exist in the hearts of the, the people who take the class, which seems kind of strange because people who come to a place like Sar Shalom at this point, have gone through the initial opening class of Hatkala and are pursuing a Yeshua-centered Jew way of life, a Jewish way of life, it would seem that the question of anti-Semitism would be non-existent. However, what we came to realize uh, through the years was that that wasn't always true. That most of the people who come from particularly a Christian background, oftentimes have kind, sometimes buried within themselves uh, either a covert, oftentimes a covert, sometimes an overt, uh, anti-Semitism. And, and it's, a, it's something that they may not even be aware of, something that they have that they're not even aware of. So the purpose of this class was to explore the complete irrationality of anti-Semitism in the world and how it exists. Everybody has prejudice in the world and prejudice that exists. There was a point in time in America, for instance, um, where the lowest class of people, the ones that took the, the hardest rap, were the Irish. Many people think, when they think about the African-American population of the United States, when slavery existed, many people think that the slave in the 1860s and 1850s and 40s and so on, uh, that the slave was the lowest class of person. But in actuality, back in those days, an Irishman was considered less than a slave. They were considered to be uh, not as, as important, not as valuable, whatever. But never has there been in history a, a single people group that has been hated so universally by every other people group in virtually every part of the world, as, as has the Jewish people group. Um, this class is not intended to be a, um, a scolding, if you will, of church history, but we will see in this class that Unfortunately, one of the chief propagators of anti-Semitism in the world, the one who've, who've seemingly have kept, kept it alive, have been, has been the Christian world. Uh, and we will see, even in this class this week, uh, this opening week, how that was relevant, particularly in the days of the church fathers. Now, m many people, not all, but many people who come to Sar Shalom come from a church background. They've been baptized in the church, one denomination or the other. Frankly, it doesn't really matter which denomination that is. And we all know that, that when we um, are exploring our DNA, that we know that we get our DNA from both our father and our mother. 
Well, it just so happens that the church fathers, as they're called, all of them were vehement anti-Semites. So it stands to reason, some of whom were worse in theology or at least equal to somebody like Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler looked to them and actually to justify his insanity. But uh, it stands to reason that the Christian who's been baptized into the church uh, has spiritually received an element, to one degree or the other, of that anti-Semitic DNA of the church father. And that that's, holds true, I find anyway, in most cases. Even amongst people who are, are believers, Christian believers, and they, quote, love Israel. And that's a strange phenomenon. All this is designed to kind of cut through the surface and get down into the soul of the, of the person in order to set us free so that we can really walk as God wants us to walk. So you have somebody who loves Israel. Uh, they are, they're, Zion, they're Zionistic Christians, and they begin to understand that, you know, the Torah is for today, so to speak. And they, they want to learn more, and they, they come to a place like Sar Shalom to, to do just that. But what they discover is, I love Israel, but I don't really love Jews. And there's a distinction that I'm pro-Israel, but I'm not really pro-Judaism. Sometimes this manifests when people say to me, well, I mean, I get the Torah, and I get the festivals, and I get all this other stuff, and I get that, you know, Yeshua, this is how Yeshua lived, but I don't have to be a Jew, do I? Well, that's an anti-Semitic statement. If you really think about it, that's, a, that's an anti-Semitic statement. I don't have to be a Jew, do I? Well, what's, well, first of all, what's wrong with being a Jew? You're, the Messiah is Jewish, and if you think about it logically, it doesn't make any sense. All of us together, no matter what our background is, we serve the God of Israel. We're following the commandments of Israel. And we follow the Messiah of Israel. So all of these elements are Jewish elements. All of them are Jewish elements. And so we'd say concerning all of these things that we do, but we don't want to be a Jew. And you'll learn when you go to the, uh, to be a Jew class, you'll learn that Jew, the term Jew, uh, Hebrew, Israelite are all synonymous terms. They're, and they've been used as synonymous terms for the, the last 2,500 or 3,000 years or so, uh, at least 2,500 years. So uh, to say that you follow the God of Israel, that is the God of the Jews, or the God of the Hebrews, so you follow the commandments of the God of the Jews, the God of the Hebrews, and so on, and the Messiah, the God of the Hebrews, and all these, but you yourself don't want to be Jewish, that is indicative, that's a symptom of an anti-Semitic problem. So normally when we go through this course and we look at the different, the history, we begin to, to discover just how insidious it is, normally what happens is throughout the course, people begin to identify anti-Semitic themes within their own heart. And, uh, and through prayer um, and through teshuva, dispense with them. And what that does is it frees us up to be able to follow God without any, any inhibitions, to be able to say, we want to do this, we want to, we want to obey God's word. We're also going to look at least uh, briefly at the history of uh, the church as it, as it is. Um, it, to me, it's a great mystery because on the one hand, you have a church world. If you just take straight line Christianity and what Christianity teaches, you have a, a church doctrine that is very antithetical to, to, to biblical idea. And, and, it, and in, in a lot of ways, if you look at it just pragmatically and logically, is, is really, uh, frankly, kind of heretical and blasphemous. Uh, in fact, I had an encounter this week where I was chatting online with a member, and I didn't, I didn't know it at the time. It was just somebody online, and I didn't know that they were a member of a Messianic congregation in Dallas. And it's, it's, a, it's a congregation that's been around for a long time. They're well-known, blah, blah, blah. Um, I've known a little bit about this congregation, but not a whole lot. But I didn't know that this person was a member. I didn't know anything about them other than I knew they were Messianic. And they were saying they're online that they'd like to tell Jews about Jesus. So, and they mentioned something about a Southern Baptist background. So I was, that sparked my curiosity. So my question to the person was, well, what do you tell them about Jesus? 
And their response was a typical Christian response you would expect from anybody who told anybody about a Christian version of Jesus. So my follow-up question is, okay, so I'm trying to, I thought, well, maybe I can help this person. They really do want to relate to Jewish people. So I said, well, do you keep kosher or do you keep um, the Sabbath or do you, do you, do you keep or any other mitzvot? Is there anything else that you do aside from that? And the person responded and basically said, well, I eat kosher if I happen to be around Jewish people or something like that, you know. Uh, but one of the leaders of the synagogue that they attend, I guess, saw the, congregation, the conversation and chimed in and said, well, why would he? Because we have been set free of the law of sin and death. And so a, a longer conversation ensued. Uh, the person was pretty snarky about it. But basically what I was coming to is like, wait, let me get this straight. Are you saying that the scripture of the, what you call the Old Testament is a scripture of sin and death? And, and essentially, that's what they were saying. They were saying that, yes, and Messiah came to set us free from that. Well, that's, that's blasphemous, frankly. I mean, I mean, if you really think about it, to call the word of God sin and death is blasphemous. And it's, it's not only blasphemous, but it's, it's blatantly contradictory to the word itself. Having said that, it is remarkable to me that Hashem somehow is able to extrapolate out of those congregations people who really do love him and want, want to follow him, and many people have found their way to Messiah, myself included, through that venue. Uh, nevertheless, there exists, when people come to that venue, they collect this anti-Semitic anti uh, uh, soul and ideology. And it exists. It exists, it exists and even in a, in a Messianic congregation. It can even exist there. You can have people who attend Messianic congregations that really don't like Jews, don't like Orthodox Jews. So in this class, we talk about a lot of real things. We talk about a lot of real history and real experiences. The purpose is not to just bring out and air all the dirty laundry. The purpose is really to take a very realistic view of what we think about the idea of Jews and Judaism. And, and I just want to separate it out for a minute from the people, just looking at a concept of Jews and Judaism, because we will discover as we go through this course that when it came to the Inquisition, for instance, the enemy was not, con he was not satisfied with just killing Jewish people. Once all the Jews were out of Spain and southern France and so on, all the Jews are basically gone. There's no Jews left. Well, the government went on a campaign to rid itself of everything Jewish. Jewish literature, Jewish philosophy, everything. The enemy wants to destroy the covenant and the covenantal people. And that's what most people don't understand. This is why Jewish people uh, who tried to become reform or basically just assimilate, why they're still hunted, is because they're a covenantal people. And this is why you, you can have a Torah-observant uh, walk devoid of any Judaism and still be under assault because the enemy wants to get rid of everything Jewish. So we look at situations. I had a, um, uh, going back about two or three years ago, I was talking to a, a gentleman who had left Messiah, unfortunately, and converted to Orthodox Judaism. And he was, he was pretty hostile to me at first because, naturally so, because he kind of viewed me, I guess, like other Messianic, as he had viewed Messianic leaders. But then he softened a bit when he understood the uh, observance level that I embraced and, and sought after. And I think, I just guessing that probably he wished he had, he had run into that before. But the, where his troubles began is he was a non-Jewish person uh, who believed that he had come from a Anusim background, but he didn't have any way to prove that just going off of his last name. But really all that's irrelevant. But, but when he came to Messiah and he started to attend a very large Messianic congregation in Dallas, uh, which is where most of them, if not all of them are, um, he got very zealous for the Torah. He's following Messiah, and 
all of a sudden, he's going to this congregation, and and it seems very Jewish. I mean, there's a Torah, there's, a, there's an ark, there's there's uh, blessings being spoken, and you know, uh, you know, there, there's this illusion of uh, keeping the festivals and everything. It's just, Hebrew everywhere, and so he's very excited, and this is what he's been longing for. And so what he does is he starts to investigate how to keep the mitzvot. And so he starts wearing a tallit katan, wearing a kippah, eating kosher. Next thing you know, he's, he's dressing in black and white, and he's still coming to shul. He's still coming to the Messianic synagogue. He still believes in Yeshua, but he starts encountering resistance. For, first of all, he's not of qualified Jewish blood, so that's a problem. Uh, so he can't, he can't, there's no verification process. Um, and then the people that are there, you know, of course, they grew up in a Jewish home. And that's always an interesting statement. Um, so anyway, he said to me, he said, the last straw was is that I, I came in and I was dressed like I am today. And the way he was dressed when I was talking to him was a, a white shirt, black suit. And I had seat seat and a keep on. And I walk into shul and I'm greeted by an elder who says to me, you're dressed like the enemy. And he said, I just walked out. And that was it. And I started attending a uh, Orthodox synagogue who embraced me with open arms, took me through conversion, and here I am today. And he's convinced, of course, unfortunately, that Yeshua is not the Messiah. But you can see where that seed was planted. But that's why I say there's anti-Semitism that exists. This is not an intention. I don't mean to paint a negative picture for the sake of painting a negative picture. It's to identify a reality that exists. And why would somebody who is the elder at a, at a Messianic synagogue, who is trying to reach Jewish people, allegedly, why would they say to somebody, you're dressing like the enemy? Wait a minute. These are the people you're trying to reach, right? But they're the enemy? And to that matter, this is kind of an aside. I asked a Messianic leader one time, I said, aren't you trying to reach Jewish people? And he said, uh, well, yeah, I mean, that our whole, my whole life has been dedicated to that purpose. I said, okay, then why don't you separate meat and dairy? Blank look. What's well, fundamental to Judaism? There's no such thing in Judaism as eating kosher and having a cheeseburger. Even if it's kosher cheese and kosher burger, putting two together is not kosher. So for you to say to a Jewish person, well, we eat kosher, um, and I have cheeseburgers, that's, that's, that's phonyism, that's fraudism. And even if you didn't believe it, even if you didn't think it was valid, which I think is a problem, but that's beside the point. Even if you didn't think it was valid, if you're really trying to reach Jewish people, wouldn't you make that your way of life? And if you, I said, if you, went to a, if you went to a country in Africa and they told you that these people, if they see you eating fish, it's extraordinarily offensive. It will put up a brick wall. You won't even be able to share the gospel with them because you ate fish. If you knew that, to go to that country, I bet you $100 on the table right now, you would not put a bite of fish in your mouth the whole time you were there. And yet, you who grew up in a Jewish home um, do this. And so... My point to that was, it begs the question, what are you really doing? What's your real motivation? Because you're clearly not trying to reach Jewish people. Now, that does not win friends and influence people in the, when you do that in the Messianic world. But I, it's just, to me, it's, just, it's logic, and you just have to ask those questions. And I submit to you that that partly is born out of an anti-Semitic spirit, which is the point of the class. So let's just begin by looking at some ancient history, and then this will lead us, the ancient history will lead us to the original church fathers. Anti-Semitism, as I said a while ago, is not limited to church fathers or to Christianity by any stretch of the imagination. Clearly, even though Hitler used Christianity as his basis, he himself was an occultist. Okay. Some say he worshipped the Nordic deities or or maybe if he himself wasn't really, people in his circle uh, were Nordic worshipers. Uh, but it is true that Jews typically find a more friendly environment around pagans than they do around Christians. Maybe this is why most Israelis vacation in India. Because uh, in India... 
there's, there's, I, someone told me, I have a friend who lives in India who is a believer in Yeshua and follows Torah. Um, and he has been to Sar Shalom and he did some contract work in America. Uh, and he told me that um, there's something to the effect of like three million deities in Hinduism or something, something crazy like that. Uh, but anyway, I'll tell you something else he shared with me that's kind of outside the scope of the class, but about that. So uh, we're going to be covering in this, each week we're going to cover basically two chapters of the book. Because if you want to order the book online, you know, later you can do that, Convenient Hatred, the History of Anti-Semitism. This week we'll be covering chapters one and two, and I'm going to extrapolate out just some highlights, high points, and I recommend you go back and read through the book um, because it's really fascinating history. Uh, A Convenient Hatred... The History of Anti-Semitism, and the author is Phyllis Goldstein. Phyllis Goldstein. Half Price Books, books, Amazon. I think I found this one at Half Price Books, frankly. So uh, some scholars believe, according to the book anyway, that anti-Semitism first reared its ugly head in 586 BCE. Now in that that time frame... um, the only thing that really made Jews different than the rest of the people, because everybody kind of seemingly dressed the same and acted the same, there was really three things that separated Jews from everybody else. But these three things have consistently been the points of attack from anti-Semitism. The first thing is monotheism, the concept there's only one God, that you don't worship a bunch of other deities. The second thing is the Shabbat, Taking one day a week and resting, that was always viewed as weird. And even in our culture today, where we have a weekend, so two days of rest a week, not working is kind of culture. But it's amazing and remarkable when you tell people, I don't do anything on the Shabbat. I rest, I go to shul, take a nap, I don't shop, I don't whatever, I don't cook. People look at you like you're crazy nowadays. Because they, even though we have a week in, our week never really ends. People are just working consistently and constantly. It's amazing how, and I know you've seen it too, and I just marvel at it. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm, not uh, I'm, I'm kind of, my age has granted me the ability to live in a world before pagers and cell phones existed, to now live in a world where I can watch television on my iPad anywhere in my house, you know, uh, I had somebody come to the house this week and install the, the t- TVs, and they're all, they're all Wi-Fi. I don't even need a little thing in the wall anymore. It's just amazing. But anyway, it's also, I, I've lived in a, I've, I've been alive when they had the blue laws, you know, the, the Sunday laws, and, and I've seen them go away. So as I'm out and about on, on a Yom Rishon, and I'm at the store, to see people come in in their church clothes, shopping and doing different things, it just boggles the mind because there's no rest. You go to church, and, and I, I get it because there was a day and age when I was living a similar life, and I'd go to services like that, and then you go eat, and then you go to the store or what have you. And, and I realize now how, how, how much bondage that is and how your, your flesh doesn't want you to rest. Well, in antiquity, it was the same way. Everybody worked seven days a week. And to think that you would take a day off, people saw that as weird, as lazy. Commonly, it's just lazy. And then, of course, the third thing was circumcision. If you think about how radical that was in the ancient world, circumcision. So what is it today? Today, anti-Semites, when they want to attack Jews and Judaism, they normally go after the Shabbat. They normally go after anti, uh, circumcision and uh, sometimes of monotheism. Monotheism has become more popular today with the rise of the Christian mind and, and Islam and so on. But still, uh, the idea that uh, there's a single path, normally it's expressed today that there's not a single path, that multiple, multiple paths today is the multiple gods of yesterday. So it's the same thing. It's just a, it's not monotheism. So um, it's interesting to note that the Middle East is the only place in the world where three continents come together. It's very remarkable. It really illustrates why God chose the land of Israel because this was a trafficking point. People 
would travel right through the Middle East to get to other sides of the world. So what better place to, to position the spreading of Torah than in a place like that? Where it's like, it's like having a... Uh, it's like having a Torah stand on Interstate 35, you know. It's just a, it's just a great place. I'm, I'm sorry? Yeah, I think the Silk Road going from the east to the west. Right, exactly. And this is also why there was places like in Ephesus and things like that, that they were later in the days of the Apostle Shaul, that they were an amalgamation of all these different faiths because people were just drawing and just adding from different things. So... Um, it was also customary in antiquity for people to readily adopt the patron deity of whatever conquering nation happened to conquer their nation at the time. Everybody did that, except for Jews. So they got conquered. They refused to worship the God of the conqueror. Uh, everybody else did. And so, again, you have a people group that is standing out, in this, in this case, about monotheism. They are not complying with the norm of the rest of the world. So that sparks an anti-Semitic spirit. Uh, according to this uh, situation, the, the scholars believe that anti-Semitism really began in what was called the diaspora or the scattering. And even in the days of King David and King Shlomo uh, and the days of Judah and Israel when they were two separate kingdoms, Jewish people still chose to live outside the land of Israel for one reason or the other. Economic reasons, I don't know, maybe they, they, they found a prettier coastline. But being out amongst the nations, they ran into this anti-Semitic spirit, and of course it, it, caused, it caused problems. So the book brings down that in the, in the, the first really known episode of anti-Semitism, happened on an island called Elephantine, which happened to be an island in the middle of the Nile in Egypt. And this occurred in 600 BCE, 600 BCE. So in those days, foreign emperors and foreign kings liked to hire basically, uh, what's it called, mercenary soldiers from other countries to be in their army and it's interesting, this is the quote from the book, which is relevant to the politics of our day. In those days, emperors often hired foreign soldiers to protect their borders because they did not want to arm their own people. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Why do you think that was? You don't want to put weapons in the hands of your citizens because it's hard to control people who are well-armed. So what they would do is they would hire foreign soldiers to come and be in the army, and they were loyal to the government because they're being paid well, and all the citizens keeps them in line because nobody's armed. They can't, they can't fight the military. Well, it just so happened that some of these soldiers who took these jobs were Jewish soldiers. They were Jews who maybe, maybe they were having a hard time in Israel, so they said, you know what? We will go and uh, serve in the military of Egypt, and they happened to live on the island Elephantine, which was uh, seemingly like a nice place in the middle of the Isle, the middle of the Nile, rather. And uh, they, set up a, they set up community there. But also on that little island, I don't know how big the island was, but also on that island, there were Egyptians who lived there who were also evidently paid soldiers. And there was also Syrians who lived there. It was kind of an amalgamation. But they, the Egyptians worshipped the, a god whose name is Kanum, and he was a ram god. Now, on the island of Elephantine, it says here in the book that, uh, that the Jewish people there, for whatever reason, they maintained their identity as Jews and the religious life, and they built a temple on the island. Now, for, for whatever reason, the Jewish people who live there, now the temple exists in Israel right now. Maybe they had a falling out with the priesthood. Who knows? But for whatever reason, they chose to build a temple on the island. And so they had their own sacrifices going on on the island. Some, some say maybe that was there before the temple was built, perhaps. And so they just continued the tradition. But nevertheless, they are making sacrifices and the Egyptians have a deity that they worship and it happens to be a ram. Do you see a problem here? So you got Jews who are killing rams and sacrificing them and the Egyptians are worshiping them. So obviously tensions begin to build 
And uh, in 410 BCE, the Egyptians take an opportunity. They attack the Jews there. They burn the temple. They burn down many homes. Now, in this case, the Jews, and remember, the Jews are hired soldiers. So a little war ensues on Elephantine. And so they, they are able to gain back their land, but the government doesn't allow them to rebuild their temple. Uh, they can maintain their life, but not the temple because they figured, the, I guess the government figured in order to keep peace, it'd probably be best not to be sacrificing the God of your neighbor. Um, so, I mean, you think about that. Uh, this is, we talked about this, uh, about Egypt. Uh, in, in ancient Egypt, the, the lamb was considered the chief deity. And so uh, we can see that when sacrifice a lamb at Pesach, why that would be a problem. But this is the beginnings of anti-Semitism. And it really, what does this teach us? It teaches us that, that frankly, at its, at its core, the religion of Hashem is antithetical to the religion of the world, which is really why anti-Semitism exists. If you think about our faith, it's, com- it's, a, it's a complete odds with the rest of society. Our faith values honesty. Our faith values modesty. Our faith values ceasing from working on Shabbat. It values monotheism. It values, uh, you know, um, circumcision as a uh, religious custom. And our society is antithetical to all of that. It it doesn't value modesty. Everybody should go their own way. No rules. All roads lead to heaven, you know, that type of thing. So why does, spiritually, why does anti-Semitism exist? I think ultimately it's because it's, it's a spiritual battle, of course, between light and darkness. And it centers around the Torah. It centers around Jewish people. Later on in history, there is, uh, it talks about, the, again, the beginnings of anti-Semitism in a place called Alexandria, which is also in Egypt. This is where Philo lived, who was a uh, Hellenistic Jewish scholar, Philo. Interesting to me, I didn't realize the statistic, but apparently in Alexandria, Jews made up 40% of the city's population. That's huge, 40% of the city's population. Just so happens that the reason the Septuagint was, was written, translated in, the Septuagint is the Torah translated into Greek, the reason this was done was because of the Jews in Alexandria. The Jews in Alexandria, most of whom spoke Greek and not necessarily Hebrew, and they needed a copy of the Torah in their own language. And so this is why we have the Septuagint. As an aside, this is a complete aside from history, a statistic I read recently that I did not know. My family, historically Jewish, comes from southern Louisiana. And one... uh, uh, a lot of uh, Jewish, French, Jewish families in southern Louisiana. At the time, of course, nowadays, everybody who's Jewish seemingly comes from New York. Like, that's the big, that's the big place, right? Well, at the time of the American Civil War in the 1860s, one-third of all the Jews in the United States lived in Louisiana. And the largest synagogue in the United States was in Charleston, South Carolina. So... Um, I believe, being a Civil War historian, I believe that at the time of the Civil War, the, before that, one of the main entry points in the United States was Charleston and Mobile, Alabama, and Galveston. After the Civil War, or during the Civil War, actually, it transitioned to Ellis Island because you got a, a naval blockade in the rest of America. So that everybody. So after the Civil War, Ellis Island just remains to be the entry point, which is why you have so many Jews in New York today. But before that, it was Louisiana. And one of the reasons it was Louisiana is because uh, even prior to the Spanish Inquisition, there was a French Inquisition. There was a French um, 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 anti-Semitism that erupted, which caused many of those Jewish families to swear allegiance to the Catholic Church and make their way to the Americas, initially to Port Royal, which is now Nova Scotia, but then eventually to what would become the French um, colony of Louisiana, which is where my family ended up. So it's just an interesting point. So the Septuagint is written for them, and there is a problem that erupts in Alexandria because you have all these Jews who live there, and then you have um, 
non-Jews who are Greek and they value Greek custom and they're living uh, in this area as well. And this is what it says. It says, in the first decades of the common era, Appion, a Greek lawyer in Alexandria, wrote and spoke against Jews. He claimed that they were a a diseased race of lepers, a godless people who worshiped the head of an ass in their temple in Jerusalem. He insisted that once a year, Jews kidnapped a Greek and fattened him up so that he could be sacrificed to their deity. These and other false charges would find their way from Alexandria to Rome and eventually into the works of Roman and later Christian writers. Some non-Jews in Alexandria and elsewhere became Jews. Others observed Jewish festivals and commandments without a formal conversion. So you can imagine, here we have a situation where lies are being spoken about Jews, which is very much the case in, in world history. And then on top of that, you have all these Greeks that are very proud about their Greek culture, and they're trying to get people to become Greek, essentially. And then, on t- then you have the, the complexity of Greeks who are converting to Judaism. So this is just a, a big cocktail of bad things that are about to happen. So on, in August of 38 CE... King Agrippa I, the Judean uh, Roman puppet king of Israel, visits Alexandria. And the Jews there welcome him. It's it's a great, you know, hey, the the Jewish king is coming, so this is good, right? So everybody's having a, they welcome him. Well, the Egyptians and the Greeks that live there don't like this, and so they start a riot. And they burn synagogues, they kill men, women, and children. The governor of the time, a man named uh, Governor Flaccus, He had been appointed by the Caesar Tiberius. But Tiberius had died, and Caligula had taken his place. Now, Caligula was evidently an insane Caesar, literally insane. And so Flaccus is concerned, if he's got a bunch of riots going on in his city, that Caligula is, he's going to fall out of favor with Caligula. So he takes a... um, a misstep, turns out really bad for him, he decides that the Jews are the problem. So basically, he doesn't do anything. In fact, he kind of helps, you might say, the Egyptians and the Greeks continue their rampage against the Jews because his thought process probably, hey, if I get rid of all the Jews and I'll have peace in the city, you know, because after all, we are Romans, right? And so we're more closely aligned with the Greeks than we are the Jews. Well, it doesn't work out so well because in the Roman society at the time, they're a pagan culture, and basically they just kind of accept all roads that lead to heaven, right? So they, let, they have a pantheon of deities they believe in, and they allow, it's kind of Roman policy that Jews can be Jews, and they can worship their God, and we don't really care. And one of the reasons Romans believe that is because Judaism existed before Rome, and that, so they give honor to a religion that has existed before they existed. So it turns out that uh, Caligula has Flaccus brought to Rome and tries him for these atrocities and puts him in prison. But nevertheless, this war erupted. Alexandria is never really the same. The, the Caligula does make an e, or actually Claudius. Claudius, who uh, Caligula is assassinated, and uh, I guess because he was so crazy. And so Claudius makes an edict to Alexandria and basically tells both parties, stop it, settle down, quit fighting each other, quit killing each other. But it doesn't really help. They continue. It's always this, it's always a uncomfortable situation. So these are, this is where anti-Semitism really has its roots in ancient, the ancient world. Okay. So the book progresses from there and begins to talk about the wars with Rome. So let's talk about the wars with Rome. And first off, evidently in 4 BCE, there is an initial Jewish rebellion, which you had in in Israel. First of all, uh, we have the Maccabean period. We have the the Hanukkah period, right? So uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, who believed, the reason he's called Antiochus Epiphanes is because he believed that he was God manifest. He was a Greek general, one of the generals who served under uh, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great actually admired the temple and Judaism, and therefore he didn't. He spared the city. 
so the Maccabeans revolt against Antiochus Epiphanes. They vanquish, through God's help, they vanquish this, this Greek army, which is like saying that uh, Chad, Africa, defeated the United States in battle, uh, which probably could happen today, but couldn't happen in former years. Um, unless the Marines, as long as the Marines aren't involved, right? <laughs> so, um, so that happened. But the Maccabees, the Hasmoneans, were a priestly class. They saw fit, for whatever reason, to make themselves the ruling class. Now they became king priests, whereas before they were just supposed to be priests. And they did not allow, as it were, the Davidic dynasty to assume the kingship. So now there's infighting in Israel uh, because the Hasmoneans are not supposed to rule, and there's people who know that, and there's all this infighting. And, and I, somebody, I believe it was the Hasmonean ruler, appealed to Rome to come and help settled a dispute. And to make a long story short, basically what happened is the Roman army showed up, and since they were fighting amongst themselves, they took Jerusalem without firing a shot, so to speak. Walked in, set up rulership, set up camp, and everybody, when they stopped fighting each other, realized that Rome was now in control of Israel. And that's how Rome took control. It did not start out as a conquest, but that's how it happened. So now you have Jewish people, zealots as they were called, who even though Rome was generally benevolent to Judaism, they allowed them to have their own worship. They kind of allowed them to have their own priesthood, although the high priest who was supposed to serve for life, if you remember, according to the Torah, and was supposed to be at the lineage of Aaron, in the days of the Roman governors, the, Rome, the Roman governor appointed the high priest as he saw fit and used him as a political puppet. So Caiaphas, for instance, was a Roman appointee of Pontius Pilate. He was not necessarily, uh, we don't know for sure, I don't know, for, I, I've, no one's ever told me for sure if he was of the lineage of Aaron or if he was even eligible for the priesthood. He was simply put in place by Pontius Pilate. Before Pontius Pilate, I forget the Roman governor's name. It escapes me at the moment. But he had replaced, I believe it was something to the effect of five, five high priests as he just saw fit. He just would rotate them out, whoever would do his bidding. So it was very much a corrupt system is the point. So in 4 BC, apparently the Jewish zealots have enough and they start a little rebellion. And so Rome, one thing about Rome is they don't put up with stuff right? If Rome was in charge of Israel today, there wouldn't be a Gaza because they would just go and burn it all to the ground. They dealt with rebellion very harshly. So when they rebelled in 4 BC, the historians say that there were 2,000 Jews crucified outside the gates of Jerusalem. That's how they dealt with, um, with this. Incidentally, it's worth noting that there were literally tens of thousands of people crucified by the Romans, but do you know that today there are no remains of any, no known remains except one of any crucifixion victims? To the extent that we have no idea what the execution stake looked like. Christians believe it was a cross, but frankly, that's not the word used in the Greek. It's a stake that's used. And historians don't know if it was a cross or if it was a T or if it was a pole or if it was a tree or if it was all the above. They don't really know. The and the only remains they've ever found of a crucifixion victim happened to be a Jewish person. And they found the ossuary. And in the ankle bone was a, a, a execution stake. And between the ankle bone and the stake was a piece of wood that evidently, evidently was there to prevent the person from pulling the nail off his foot. And it was a piece of acacia wood which is significant because everything in the tabernacle was made with acacia. So some wonder if the, the execution stakes that the Romans used in Judea were made of acacia wood, which would have been very, very hard. They would have been reusable because acacia does not, uh, it is impervious to insects. It does not deteriorate like other wood does. And it just so happens that the other tabernacle, uh, the tabernacle, everything in the tabernacle was made using acacia wood including the altar. So it would be very interesting if Messiah Yeshua was executed on acacia wood using a bronze spike, which the altar was made out of bronze too. It's just an interesting point. But out of all these victims, I don't know why there's no remains if there isn't. You would think there'd be somebody somewhere. 
Maybe it's because they just got them off the execution stakes and threw them into a pile somewhere. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, but this happened. So in 66 CE is when the first major revolt begins. This revolt ends with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, which happens on the 9th of Av, the 9th of Av. Okay, so the first temple, or excuse me, the second temple was destroyed. The first temple was destroyed in 50, 586 BCE by the, uh, the Babylonians. First of all, um, some of you probably know this already, just a, a, a very, very few Jews came back to Israel. Most of them stayed in Babylon. This is why you have the Babylonian Talmud. It's not because it's pagan, as people have said. It's because that in Babylon, there was this huge Jewish community. Babylon, which is present-day Iraq, there's this huge Jewish community. And they, once they got exiled there, they just decided to stay. It's kind of like Jews in America. Once they stayed, the very few Jews have left America to go to Israel. Very, very few. Uh, because they have a good life here, and so they decided to leave, live here. Right or wrong, it just is what it is. So in 66 CE, there's a revolt begins. It, leads, it ends in disaster. It ends with the complete destruction of the temple in 70 AD, which happens to be on the 9th of Av. So this doesn't bode well. Now Jews are just very much persecuted within the Roman Empire. It's, it's, it puts a bad taste in everybody's mouth about Jewish people. If that wasn't bad enough, then... The zealots decide that they're going to revolt again in 132 CE at the leadership or with the leadership of a man named um, Shimon Bar Kokhba, who Rabbi Akiva, who is a convert to Judaism and the, one of the most acclaimed rabbis of all time, declares as Messiah. Interesting fact: Rabbi Akiva never denounced his decision. He died at the hands of the Romans after Bar Kokhba was defeated, but he never recanted saying that he was a Messiah, even though, Rabbi, uh, even though Shimon Bar Kokhba died on the battlefield. Why? Because in Jewish understanding, the Messiah has to die. And some say die in battle for the sins of Israel. So Rabbi Akiva had no reason to recant his belief that Bar Kokhba was a Mashiach because Jews understood the Mashiach must die first as Messiah ben Yosef and then be raised to life. So he probably expected he would be raised to life and bring in the Messianic era. Just that's an aside note that I wanted you to know. So this happens in 132 CE. Hadrian decides to rename, or how this starts, I should say, in 132 CE, Hadrian decides to rename Jerusalem Aelia Capitolina in honor of Jupiter. And Hadrian decides that he's going to build a temple to Jupiter where the original temple stood. Well, this is, why, this is how Shimon Bar Kokhba is able to initiate the second revolt. You're not going to rename the city. You're not going to build a temple to Jupiter on top of the original grounds. And Rabbi Akiva declares him Messiah. The, the, the uh, revolt starts. And, of course, Hadrian, who was a, the, the emperor at the time, sends an overwhelming Roman force to defeat the rebellion. And it comes to a conclusion at the Battle of Bethar in 135 CE, which I happen to, I just want to say that this ha the Battle of Bethar, uh, the Romans attack and they kill everybody in the city, including Bar Kokhba, all the inhabitants, men, women, and children, and it happens on the 9th of Av. Completely unrelated, but of interesting historical note, the Alamo happened in a place called San Antonio de Bejar, which is not really, it sounds the same, but it's not the same word. But I thought it was interesting, you have Bethar and, and San Antonio de Bejar. So anyway, that's just a historical nerd coming out there. But... Um, this, this is the final straw. Hadrian raises Ju Jerusalem to the ground, basically destroys the city almost entirely. He uh, forbids Jews from entering Jerusalem proper, except on the 9th of all. That's the one day they can come to the city and mourn the temple. And he renames the entire Israel area Palestine. And the reason he does it is it's actually, in Latin, it's Felicia, named after the Philistines. 
because he knows that the arch enemy of the Jews was the Philistines, so he names their land after their enemies. It's a slap in the face. This is why it's quite anti-Semitic for somebody to refer to Israel as Palestine or Palestine. It'd be like saying Goth- Gotham is Jokerland. So this is the arch enemy of the Jews, and that's why Hadrian does that. Any questions so far? We have a few minutes left in our class here before we get into church history, but any, any questions thus far in our, in our fast track through the opening centuries of the world? No? So this leads us, we have the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. By this time, uh, for lack of a better term, we're going to say Christianity, but I don't like that term, but we're just going to use it for the sake of the class. Christianity is, uh, is, is starting to get its early stages. It's important to know, by the way, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Tradition tells us that the apostle Paul died in 68 AD. So uh, with that, we would know that the apostle Shaul never saw the destruction of the temple, which is why, and we we know, by the way, he continued to sacrifice at the temple, participate in the temple service, but his eyes never saw the destruction. He was killed before that time frame. 70 AD, there there wasn't a single gospel written yet. 70 AD. Messiah, according to best guess, was crucified roughly 33 AD. 70 AD is roughly 40 years later. Um, I think there, there, there's only a handful of apostolic letters that have been written. Uh, maybe Galatians. I'm trying to think of uh, what other, some others are. I forgot my days. I think Galatians was written, they, they say, in, in the 50s. It's all guesses. But the fact of the matter is, there, uh, the a lot of the, the writings of John have not been written. Revelation has not been written. So there's a lot to be done here. So this is how the, the book starts out talking about Jews and Christianity. This, this is instructive. So in the, it says, in the first century of the common era, it's, and I'm just going to use, the, I'm just going to quote exactly how they say it here. In the first century of the common era, Jesus of Nazareth lived as a Jew among Jews. He prayed in the synagogue observed Jewish law, including the dietary laws, and probably wore the fringes on his clothing. It says probably, but we know for sure he did, because the gospel say so. That is the zizit in Hebrew, as required for Jewish men. His earliest followers did the same. Yet, by the end of the fourth century, Jesus' followers had left the synagogue and established a new religion known as Christianity. Now, isn't it interesting it says here, and they're correct, by the end of the 4th century. So from 33 AD, in the three years prior to that, we, according to this and all other historians, we have Yeshua, the Messiah, who is living a completely Jewish life. Completely Jewish life in every respect. And then, roughly 300 and some odd years later, everything changes. So my question is, how is it that you can have a Messiah who, who's resurrected and has teaching and everybody's following the mitzvot, and then 300 late, years later, things change? Now, that to me is, if, if you are somebody who comes from a strictly con- Christian background, that doesn't bode well for your faith, okay? That the Messiah that you follow, the faith that you follow now began in the fourth century, and the Messiah you follow resurrected on the 33 AD. That's a huge gap of time that has to be accounted for. How is it that your faith changed? Before that, people were eating kosher, keeping Passover, wearing seed seed, and so on. And then 300 years later, you started. So does that, am I, y'all follow how the, the mindset there? So it goes on to say in another quote, by all accounts, Jesus lived as a Jew and like other Jews, observed the laws of the Torah. At about the age of 30, he began his ministry and was often referred to as rabbi, which means teacher. And it says, if any Jews were involved in Jesus' death, it goes on to say, they were probably Sadducees. Now, there was a gap between those two quotes, but let me explain that. One of the 
anti-Semitic points that has come up from Christian teaching is that all the Pharisees are evil and bad to the point where people would say, you don't want to be a Pharisee. In fact, we had somebody here a few weeks ago who was uh, after, on, after the service, after Oneg, stayed for the initial hot color class and began to cause a problem. Uh, and I became aware of it. Zakin uh, Yokanon was handling it just fine, uh, but was being very gracious. And so when I became aware of the problem, I recognized that, that the graciousness had extended beyond uh, where it needed to be. And I got involved in the conversation and, uh, and we escorted the gentleman out the door and asked him not to return, which doesn't happen very often, has not happened very often. We asked him not to return. He had, he was, he had come as a guest of somebody else. And so that person was fairly new. And when they, he, they went out into the parking lot together, we watched to make sure he got in his vehicle and drove off. And then when that person came back, I asked if they were okay, if they had any questions they needed to ask me or if they, you know, anything of that nature. And they said, no, uh, he just warned me, don't become a Pharisee. And I said, ah. So there, that's the heart of the matter, right? What does that come from? First of all, I'm just, y'all may know this already, but Yeshua himself was a Pharisee. There's really... That is really a statement of fact without any question whatsoever. People, is he really a Pharisee? Now, we know that Yeshua is the Messiah, is the divine Messiah and so on. Is, is he, are we saying that the divine Mashiach, the Savior of the world, is a Pharisee? Not necessarily, but I'm saying as he lived his life on the earth, the way in which he lived his life, the values that he exuded, what he, the way in which he taught was ex, ex, absolutely Pharisaical, and there's no debate about that. And one reason we know that is because through Jewish teaching, we know that Pharisees would only fellowship with other Pharisees. Would never in a million years would a Pharisee invite somebody into their house for dinner who wasn't a Pharisee. And we know that many times that he was invited to eat with the Pharisees. We also know that when the Pharisees went to him, they said, how come some of your disciples are not washing your hands? How come they're not following the traditions of our fathers? That would be a completely nonsensical statement to make to somebody who wasn't a Pharisee because the whole point of the Pharisees was we have traditions of our fathers and we want to know why you and your disciples aren't following them. That's a completely logical statement to make or a question to ask if the person you're speaking to is a Pharisee and, the ra- and a Pharisee rabbi who would be teaching this. So we know that Yeshua was a Pharisee We know that just because of what he taught, we know because of what he did. The fact that he prayed before he ate is a Pharisee tradition. Only Pharisees did that. That that very simple thing right there is indicative. Now, you, you may only hear that here. You may have figured it out on your own, but I doubt very seriously anybody will ever teach that from any pulpit, even Messianic pulpits. But Yeshua was a Pharisee. There's even a book been written by this by an Orthodox rabbi who does not believe in Messiah, who wrote a book called Jesus the Pharisee. And he's pointing out that he's totally Pharisaical. There's another book by Rabbi Boteach, who also doesn't believe in him as a Messiah, but he wrote a book called The Kosher Jesus. And he argues vehemently that Yeshua was a traditional Pharisee Orthodox rabbi who was of the school of Hillel. That was, and it's all based on his teachings. So what happened was is that uh, the church world left that. They left that, that idea. And Judaism, Jewish rabbis generally do not have a problem with Yeshua and his teachings. Now, aside from the fact that um, they don't believe he's the Messiah, but, but that aside, his actual teachings, the way he lived, they don't have a problem with him. Some of you may or may not know that in Judaism today, there is no Jewish law that exists that says that a Jew can't believe in a Messiah, which is why Akiva is, such a, is still today one of the most venerated rabbis of all time, and yet he believed in Shimon Bar, Kok- Bar Kokhba was the, a Messiah. And yet, Rabbi Akiva is still taught 
as one of the chief rabbis of all time in, in synagogues today, they didn't repudiate him, even though he was wrong about the Messiah because there's no law against believing in a Messiah as a Jew. People reject us because we believe in Yeshua, and it's absolutely hypocritical to Jewish law. Completely hypocritical, and I've had conversations about that with Orthodox rabbis, some of whom actually agree with me that it is. They would admit it, I'll put it that way. It's interesting to me that you can believe, you could believe that Nachman is the rabbi, or excuse me, Messiah. You could believe that Schneerson is the Messiah. You could believe that Bar Kokhba is the Messiah. You could believe that virtually anybody else is a Messiah. And, you know, they'll think you're kind of maybe a little Meshuggah, but they'll accept you. They'll accept you as a legitimate Jew. They may not agree with you, but they'll accept you. But the minute you say Yeshua, all bets are off. What does that tell you about the power of Yeshua? He's the only one that you can say, I believe he's the Mashiach. And you think he's a kosher Jew, right? Talking to an Orthodox rabbi. You've, you've read the book, right? You think he's a kosher? Why does I happen to think he's more than that? I think he's the Messiah. And some would say, well, I think Nachman's the Messiah. Some would say, I think Snearson's the Messiah. And they're like, oh, okay, whatever. They'll invite him to the party, but not you. What does that say about Messiah, Yeshua? I think it says a lot. So this is the, the idea. They are, they're comfortable with him, but nine times out of 10, Jewish people, the wheels fall off when it comes to Paul. Now, I think Paul's been misunderstood, but in the eyes of Orthodox Judaism, they believe it's Paul who came in and corrupted the whole thing, who taught against the mitzvot, who taught against circumcision. They believe it was Paul, and, and, and even in the book here, it brings, they, they, they uh, not to as much a degree as uh, others have, but they basically say Paul came in and uh, messed everything up. Everything was going great, but then when Paul came, everybody stopped being Jewish. Now, I think Paul's been misunderstood. I've taught about Paul's letters for years. I put them in their proper place, I think. But if you just look at it strictly from the standpoint of church history, Christians today and some Messianic congregations, many Messianic congregations, their theology is strictly based on Paul's writings. I mean, I had a, I had a, I think, I'm not sure if I mentioned, forgive me if I mentioned this because I had a lot of conversations today, but I, that, I had a run in with a Messianic congregation, uh, you know, this last week I was talking about, and they said, We've been delivered from the law of sin and death. Where does that come from? It comes from Romans chapter 7, chapter 6 and chapter 7. And so they base everything on their understanding of Paul, which if you're talking to a Jewish person, in this case, they were talking to me, who happened to believe, be a believer in Yeshua, and they're saying to me, listen, we don't have to do the mitzvot anymore because Yeshua came to deliver us from the law of sin and death, and they quoted another verse from one of other Paul's letters that say that we serve now a new covenant with a new, a new way. Both verses they quoted to me as justification for their belief come from a man named Paul. So you can see where an Orthodox Jew would say, okay, the problem is Paul. Even Mizraki is an Orthodox rabbi. You may have heard of Rabbi Mizraki. He's quite prolific on the internet with his videos. And um, the reason you hear these guys down here when I say, why? Because Mizraki is always saying, why? So anyway, um, uh, even he, he was being heckled by a messianic. In one, I don't know if he's messianic, but a, a Christian guy in one of his lectures. And Rabbi Mizraki stopped and said, you know, what about, do you follow this guy, JC? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, he's the Messiah. Okay. Do you keep Shabbat? You eat kosher? The guy was silent. Mizraki said, You're, this guy you follow is Messiah. He said, keep Shabbat, keep kosher. And he quotes Matthew 5, 17 and 18. And the guy is dumbfounded. He's sitting there with a blank look on his face. And Mizraki, the Orthodox rabbi, is saying, your Mashiach says to eat kosher and keep Shabbat and keep the festival and so on, keep the Torah, and you're sitting there not telling the Torah, and you want to tell me he's Messiah? And, of course, I'm sitting there screaming at the computer going, I wish I was there. <laughs> right? So, so this is where this starts. Um, 
uh, we just got we just got a, a couple minutes, so let, let me just conclude. We'll, uh, next week, we'll pick up. I'll share the quotes of the uh, church fathers. It'll probably be more beneficial to do it next week. Um, let me just say that, um, um, as I said earlier in the drosh, the historical record is brought down really by Josephus, um, who was a priest who lived in the first century, was a contemporary of all these people, and was a contemporary really of Messiah. Um, Josephus brings down that the people's attitude and feeling towards the Pharisees was one of, of love and admiration, and they hated the Sadducees. It's interesting to note, too, that the Sadducees were solo scriptura. What you find is that people that are solo scriptura tend, tend to be legalistic, and those who are open to one degree or the other of the so-called oral Torah tend to not be legalistic. It's an interesting phenomenon. But in any case, historically, they hated the Pharisees, excuse me, they hated the Sadducees, and they absolutely loved the Pharisees. Now, there were different groups of Pharisees. The house of Shimei was considered very legalistic. The house of Hillel was not. And in fact, in Jewish literature, uh, the rabbi who wrote the book, Jesus the Pharisee, I forget his name suddenly, but he writes in his book, he quotes from the Talmud, where um, the rabbis who wrote the Talmud refer to the synagogues of Shimei as the synagogues of Satan. So you can see where it mentions the synagogue of Satan in the apostolic writings. You can see where that would have come from because even within Judaism, a group of Pharisees under Hillel look at Shimei and his heavy headedness and say, well, that's a synagogue of Satan over there. And there are still Pharisees. And finally, on that, on that point, uh, Yeshua rebuked the Pharisees but he denounced the Sadducees when you look at his writings. When you rebuke somebody you love and you're wanting to inspire them, you scold them and try to get them to do better, right? Somebody that you don't think has any value or any hope, you just kind of discard them, you, you denounce them completely. Um, and that's, Yeshua came and he rebuked the Pharisees, but he denounced the Sadducees. So anti-Semitism develops from this idea that God came, or God rather sent Yeshua and and uh, the Messianic world would, would say, well, he sent Yeshua to deliver us from the law. That's what the church thinks. The Messianic sometimes says, well, not to deliver us from the law because the law is good, but he came to fight against the Pharisees. And it's like, no, you're still missing it. Because what that does is it germinates more anti-Semitism. So next week we'll get in, we'll just end there because we're out of time, but next week we'll get into... Uh, the next section of history, and we'll deal kind of the end part of this. We'll deal with the, um, with the quotes of the church fathers and begin to see how insidious the anti-Semitism was from the church fathers, which really birthed the rest of the church. And, of course, then we have Constantine in 325 A.D., which is really where the church actually begins um, and we'll see why there's so much anti-Semitism. But keep in mind, again, this whole course is, is geared towards looking at this thing for what it is and not just looking at information and going, this is fascinating history, but turning that inward and saying, is there any of that in me? Because that's what holds us back from following God is, is if we're constantly fighting against his people, because that's ultimately the enemy wants us to create anti-Semitism to keep us from truth. That's really his ultimate end game. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Appreciate you. Next week, week two, and we'll get into all this other topic. Thank you so much.